All these are machine-like elements. In fact, I could take the proteins out of your body, put them in a test tube, and carry out the same functions. I can do digestion in a test tube. I can do muscle contraction in a test tube. The point is this. Your body cells are made out of these intra interesting protein parts. And now, let me just talk about the fact is that, remember I showed you there's a backbone version, like on the left side of the screen, and then there's a fleshed out version on the right side. It's the same protein. The yellow is an antigen, like a virus. The blue is a protein called an antibody. What I want you to notice is, you see how the shape of the protein and the antigen are complementary? What happens if I would come up here and take out that yellow antigen? What would be left on the surface of the protein? A pocket, a cleft. What would fit back into that shape? The same thing that I pulled out of it. In other words, the shape is so specific that protein surfaces have pockets and clefts and other things plug into them. And I'll give you one more example of that. Here's an enzyme in blue, and then there's a chemical group that plugs in right in there. And look at the shape of the pocket and the chemical group. Why am I bringing this up? And the answer is this. Proteins bind to things in the environment, and they bind with a very high specificity because of the shape. And let me give you an example of this. And let me show you, actually, this is the interesting part. Let me show you where life comes from. You can see it right in this little model. It's going to work like this. First thing before I do this, I'm going to say this. The two amino acids in yellow, let's say they're negatively charged, okay? You know what like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract? Are you familiar with that? So the question is this. I'm going to show you two shapes, and then you tell me which is stable. Shape one is this one. See the shape? Okay, shape two is this one. Which is more stable, one or two? Two, because the opposite, th these like charges want to get far away as they can from each other. So I say, I showed you that the protein has two shapes, but right now I'm going to say that this is the preferred shape of the protein. Why? Because the two uh, like charges are as far apart as they can. Now a drug, a chemical, or a hormone comes into the environment, just like that antigen in the antibody, and it plugs in. And I'm going to call this a signal now. Now let's say the signal, because the signal is going to be positive, and this is negative, what's going to happen when this comes by? It's going to attract it. Now it binds it, right? Now the question is this. What charge is at the end of this chain, positive or negative? What charge is at the end of this one? Now the question is this. Is this more stable or is this one more stable? Okay, so what did you just... Now just think of the logic, what you just said. You showed me two different shapes for the same protein, right? And what's the difference? Of, why does it have two shapes? Because if I take away the charge, let's say I take away this drug, what's, what's, going to, what's the protein going to do? It's going to go back to this one, right? This is movement, right? Did it go from one to two? Did it move? Movement is the source of life. It's just the only molecules that move. Proteins move. Life comes from moving proteins. When I make the protein as it moves do work, then behavior comes from the movement of protein. So basically the question is this, where does life come from? And the answer is, First, from the structure, the proteins provide for the structure of the body, but then the proteins are capable of changing their shape. Changing shape is called conformation changing. As illustrated right here on this picture, there's a protein, and this is right out of the science journal, so it's not my pipe fittings, this is the molecular model that's in the journal. And you can see the protein in green on the left, is, this is the protein that causes muscles to contract. It's a switch, it's like an on-off switch. In the green form, the muscles don't contract. But when I add a signal, which is that white dot, it's calcium. When the calcium plugs into the molecule, it's exactly the same as the signal plunging into my protein. It changes the electrical charge. And when the charge changes on the protein, it changes its shape. So I go from confirmation to one to confirmation two. But what if I take the signal away? Well, when I take the signal away, as you saw, the protein will reset back into the original confirmation. So the point is this. A protein exists and it will not move until what happens? What is the event that causes the protein to move? The signal. So the signal, when it shows up, causes the protein to make work. So the fact is the body coordinates the functions of the system by controlling the signals to the proteins, which then control their movement. And that movement is generated into functional things like breathing and digesting and moving and excreting waste matter. It's all through these functions of the protein. So the conclusion is simple. Proteins change shape, that results in movement, and the movement is harnessed by the cell to do work. 
and behavior. So that proteins give you your, not only your physical structure, proteins also provide for your function. So when you look in the mirror and you look at your identity and your character, you're really looking at the proteins that are giving you the shape. But you also recognize this, that you can change your shape and you can change your movement because proteins also move and change their shape. So that the bottom line of life comes from protein movement. That's the truth. If you stop protein movement, life stops right at that point. And it's, proteins are the only molecules that are moving, so they become the most important ones in the generation of life. So if I have a test tube on the left side, I put all the proteins of the cell, and I have a cell on the right side with all the proteins in it, so the, the proteins are exactly the same in the left and right. The test tube is not alive, but the cell is alive. And yet it has the same protein. So the question now is, what, what is the difference between the two? And the answer is simply this. The cell has control. The test tube, all the proteins are just working randomly. There's no order, no organization, no orientation. They're just making a gamish. And they're all moving around, but they don't lead to a direction of life. To have life, I have to control the protein's functions. Then I have, I have control. And the question is, so what controls life? Now here's an assumption, and this is where it all went wrong. It goes like this. Protein parts are like parts in a car. When you drive your car, after a while, the parts wear out. Let's say you're driving along, and, you're, and you're, your tire wears out, and it goes flat. What happens to your driving then? It stops. OK, if you want it to start again, what must you do first? Replace the tire. OK, here's the point. Proteins wear out. In fact, every day you're, you're losing cells and proteins by trillions of cells and tons of proteins are getting lost because you're using them. So we have to replace the proteins. So the scientists sat back and they said, what's the simplest way to control biology? And the answer is this. If I have a function and the proteins are making the function and a protein in that function wears out, what happens to the function? Okay. If I want to have that function again, what must I do? Replace the protein. So the scientists sat back and said, well, that's the simplest and easiest way to control biology. If we can find what replaces the protein, then we will find what controls the cell. So the bottom line is they started off already with an idea that was first grounded in the science in 1859 by Charles Darwin because he said this. He said that the traits and characters and behavior of an individual are due to hereditary factors. We didn't know back in 1859 what those hereditary factors are. But by 1953, this is what we found. They were looking for the hereditary factor because they said the hereditary factor controls the protein. So the belief is this, that the pattern of the protein, the beads, you know, the colors of the beads that I'm showing you here, are built into the patterns of the subunits on the DNA helix, those little things, the rungs of the ladder. And that these DNA codes for this. And the relevance of why DNA would be the hereditary material is because DNA doesn't wear out. DNA doesn't break down. In fact, you can find fossils, like 50,000-year-old fossils, and take DNA out of the fossils and put them in a test tube and make proteins using the DNA as a blueprint, make proteins from an animal that died 50,000 years ago. The point is, the DNA is stable. There are no proteins left from that animal, but the DNA is left behind. So the point is, DNA becomes a hereditary material because DNA has the ability to be stable and not, not wear itself out, and that's what allows it to be the hereditary material. So the conclusion of science, and this is a conventional view as we're speaking right here. This is what's being taught in schools, and everyone hears the story. It's called the primacy of DNA. And what does it mean? It says, I told you, you are protein. You're a protein. Where does your protein come from? Ah, well, it comes from the DNA because that's the blueprint. And the DNA makes a Xerox copy of itself, which is called RNA, and the Xerox copy goes into the cell, and the blueprint, the RNA blueprint, is read and converted into the protein. So the bottom line is this. Here's a simple understanding. If your character is in your protein, where'd your protein come from? It came from the DNA. So therefore, your character is apparently determined by the DNA. So our belief in the primacy of DNA says this. Who you are, what you are, is predetermined in the blueprint, the DNA. So you become a readout of the DNA. So when you read articles like this in Life magazine that says, were you born this way? Now we start to recognize not only is our physical structure apparently determined by our DNA, but so is our behavior, aggression, anxiety, happiness, alcoholism, obesity, 
All these kinds of things are now attributed to what? Some pattern that you have received. So if you start to feel ill at some point, and then they start to say, well, God, that, you know, you have genes that are affecting you in this. And so the point about it is ultimately what is the belief system? The belief system is if I can understand all the genes and then I could replace any broken genes that you have and I could replace your health. It's a nice, noble concept and led to the Human Genome Project. But the conclusion of this is what? This paper just occurred, this was only uh, back in uh, May, in Science, it's a mainstream journal, and it's about the nucleus, the cell, and the nucleus is a, an organelle inside the cell where the DNA is. And I bring this up because it, it, it says exactly what the conventional point of view is. It says the nucleus is the command center of the cell. What does it mean, command center of the cell? Well, what we were looking for was the brain of the cell. As I said, every cell has all the same functions that you have. Well, you have organs to carry out your functions. Inside a cell, there are miniature organs, and they're called organelles. 